Hey there, my name is John Ravi Chander. Hey there, my name is John Ravi Chander, and uh, welcome to Circle Drive Alliance Church. Uh, welcome to Church Online. We're so glad that you can join us, uh, that you're here with us this morning, wherever you might be watching from. We're so glad that you can uh, participate and join in on our worship service this morning. Uh, we've got a lot of great stuff ahead for you. We've, we've got a great worship set coming up. And also Pastor Ron Gertson from the uh, Midwest District of the Christian and Missionary Alliance is here as well. He's going to be bringing a word in our series uh, as we continue in uh, To Be Continued, which we're exploring the book of Acts and what happened uh, after Jesus died and after he rose from the dead. Because the story didn't end there. The story didn't end with Easter Sunday. Uh, the story was to be continued. And it leads to the greatest movement in the history of humanity, which is the formation and the movement of the church. And so we're really looking forward to that word and message from Pastor Pastor Ron Gertson. But hey, I just want to welcome you here. Thank you so much for joining in, for being a part of community. Remember, church is not an event that we just come to and we watch and we experience, but church is a community that we participate in. And I just want to remind you that as, as you engage online, that even though you're online, this is still a community that you're participating in. And so, you know, throw messages in the chat throughout the service, connect with our hosts if you have any questions or if you would like prayer. Um, this is a community that we participate in. It is not an event that we consume and watch. And so I wanna invite you into that as we start our service. We're gonna be starting in just a few minutes here. So get comfortable and get ready to worship with us in just a moment. We'll see you soon. Well, good morning, everyone. Let's all stand up and sing together on this beautiful Sunday day.
The reason we're singing is you. There's nothing we love more than you. Jesus, it's all for you. The reason we're singing is you. There's nothing we love more than you. Jesus, it's all for you. The reason we're singing is you. There's nothing we love more than you. Jesus, it's all for you. We sing. There's no place 
that's right. He is the only one who can do that. And, you know, we're just gathered here today in this special community together just for that common belief of looking to that one God who just can solve everything. He can do anything. And sometimes just waiting in that moment can be really difficult. It can be uncomfortable. But if we just wait on the Lord, he's going to provide that answer at the right time, just when we need it. All we have to do is bring it to him. And whether that's through prayer with our community, just talking to each other, whatever that might look like. We just ask that he, you know, just remember this morning, he is such an awesome God. He is so mighty. He can and he will come through for us. Let's just sing this next song with that graciousness and that excitement for that wonderful God.
stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain come to you today in just an awe and thankfulness of your love for us. You are so selfless. You are so generous. God, thank you for that. Thank you for, for Jesus. And thank you for the cross. God, thank you for what that means for each of us here, for every single person here. And God, we just want to take this moment to bring all the good that is in our lives to you today in a moment of just gratitude. All of the good that is in our lives, we bring to you and we just say thank you. We come to you with a heart of thankfulness and just gratitude because everything good that we have in our world is because of you. And for that, we just say Thank you, God. Thank you, God. But in that same moment, Father, we bring all of the mess. God, we bring all that is not good. Father God, we bring all that is ugly in our lives, in the lives of people around us, in the lives of people that we love. God, we bring all of that into a moment to just connect with you, God. And we ask you and we invite you into those moments, into that mess, into that ugliness. God, because you are greater than that. You are greater. God, we invite you into that financial situation. We invite you into those relationships, God. We invite you into whatever situation, circumstance we find ourselves in that is bearing weight on us. God, we invite you into that illness, into that disease, into that loss. And God, we pray that we'd feel your presence and your peace and your comfort. God, a peace and a comfort that surpasses all of our understanding. And so we use this as a moment to connect with you. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this community that we can belong in and that we can love each other and that we can feel your love. Thank you, God. 
In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. You can go ahead and, and have a seat. Welcome to Circle. My name is, is John Ravichandra. I'm the director of youth and young adults here. And uh, I just want to say special welcome to you. Uh, every Sunday is a great Sunday. And so the fact that you are here, we're thankful that you are here and part of church community today. Uh, if you're new with us, if, if this is maybe your first time here, uh, just an extra special welcome to you. Thank you for making church. Thank you for making Circle a part of your weekend. We're just really glad that you're here. And on that note, we would love to connect with you, whether you're new or maybe you've been here for a while and you've never really had a chance to connect into the greater life of the church. Did you know there's more that goes on here outside of a Sunday? There's a lot that goes on. And so we would love to connect you into what's not just happening here on the Sunday, but what's happening here throughout the rest of this week as well. It's a very busy place. It's places happening in the week. I love it. And so you can do that by filling out that connection card. You can do that on the screen behind me there by pointing your phone at it. There's a insert in the seat pocket in front of you. If you'd like to talk to someone face-to-face -face as well, because sometimes I just find that works better for me personally, you can do that outside at the information desk and meet a real person, and they would love to connect with you, and they'd love to talk with you about connecting here at this church. Um, just a few announcements here before we, we head into our message this morning. We have a special guest speaker with us, which I'm really excited to introduce in just a moment. But our Kids Capers Camp is coming up this summer. It, it's a time where every year we, we bring in around 300 to 350 kids from the community, from Stonebridge, from around Saskatoon and area. And what an exciting, amazing opportunity to show the love of Jesus to our city. Isn't that amazing? 350 people. So, and families as well. Yeah, awesome. Now we need your help. We need your help. We're actually on a waiting list right now for kids to enter camp because we don't have enough senior leaders right now. And so if you are an adult, if you are in high school, and you would love to uh, contribute to what camp is doing, man, you have an amazing opportunity to change lives for good, to build relationships for good, to meet with kids and, and youth on their own terms, and to connect with families. What an amazing opportunity. And can I just say, as someone who did Kids Capers when I was younger for, for seven to eight years, it'll change you as well. And so can I encourage you, please do that. You can find more information on the screen behind me. You can fill that out on your information card there or come and talk to us at the desk after as well. Uh, we would love to bring in more kids, but we need your help uh, to make that possible. So would you please consider that? Now, this is really important because I'm not particularly good at it, so we definitely need your help. Uh, coming up on May, um, that is May 13th, is Working Hard in the Yard. Um, my hands have never seen an honest day's work, and so if you know me, you know that's kind of true. Um, my hands are very smooth. They're not calloused at all. So I have no idea what it means to work hard in a yard, but we're going to find out on May 13th. I might need to take the next week off. We'll see. Let's see what happens. But we have a large grounds here at, at Circle. It's beautiful if you've seen it in the summertime. Obviously, winter takes its toll. And so we have some work to do to preparing our outside grounds um, as people flood into our church uh, in spring and into the summer as well. We want to just set our, our groundskeepers up well uh, to take care of our facilities outside. And so would you consider volunteering for working hard in the yard? That's happening May 13th. That's a Saturday from 9 a.m. to noon. Again, just another opportunity where you can come in and you can be a part of church community outside of a Sunday morning. So would you please consider that? On that note, we have been approved for a couple of grants from uh, the government through Canada Summer Jobs. And so we are actively looking to hire a couple of groundskeepers for the summer. And so if that's something that interests you, if you would like even more information on that, we would love to have a conversation with you. Um, I think there's, yes, you can visit our, our website there. Come and talk to me. Come and talk to any one of us on staff or head to the information desk. But we have some uh, uh, positions open, and so we would really love to interview for those soon and get those filled up. So if that's if that's you or you know someone who that would be of interest to, uh, please pass that on to them and uh, let's make that happen. That would be great. We're very excited on May 25th to host uh, a concert here at the church. It is for King and Country, if you've heard their music. It is awesome. It is amazing. Uh, you're going to love it. But 
bad news, it's sold out. Uh, it's going to be awesome to see this place packed. But you still can come and enjoy the concert if you volunteer. How about that? So you can um, volunteer just on the screen behind me here. It is sold out, so you can't get any tickets for it unless you're willing to pay like 10 times the amount on Facebook Marketplace. And so good luck with that. Let me know how that goes. But we'd love to have you volunteer as we welcome, I don't know how many people, but a lot of people. Imagine this place sold out, right? So it's going to be an amazing time. Uh, would you consider giving your time to volunteering for that concert? Hey, we're just going to talk about our, our giving because that's something that we also do as a community. Um, you know, just in my time on staff, I, I have the, the privilege and, and the honor to be a part of a lot of different environments at the church. Um, in, in, my, in my four years that I've been on staff here, I've been able to be a part of a lot of different environments. And just this past week, uh, we've had a lot of new environments starting up and continuing. Um, that's just reminded me about um, what we do as a church. Last weekend, we had 40 grade uh, fours and fives here for a Club Connect event. And it's an opportunity that Cindy and, and Bailey sort of dreamed up with the help of some parents to encourage our kids here at church to invite their friends that maybe don't have a church home, where they can come into this space and they can see that this is, this is just a normal space. There's nothing scary about the inside of a church. I know it looks kind of shoddy from the outside with all the letters above the doors, um, but it's a really nice place inside. And they get to come with their families and they get to experience friendships and good fun and food. And it was an amazing time. And then on Tuesday, we started Alpha. Austin just launched Alpha this past Tuesday and there were a couple of dozen people there and they just had a great time exploring faith and having honest, open conversations about life and faith and some of the challenges there. What an amazing thing. And then junior high continued that night as well. And we had senior high on, on Wednesday night and there are so many things that are happening here throughout the week. And on Thursday, we'd had young adults just in our chapel where young people are learning, young adults are learning, what, it, what does it mean to follow Jesus as a young adult. And so I'm mentioning all of these things because again, I think sometimes there's a tendency to think of church as just this, that this is all that what happens. But wow, church is just not an event that we consume, but it is a community that we are participating in. And there is a life in this church outside of the Sunday morning. And can I just say, as someone who is a part of those environments, and as some of you might know, some of you that are on a team, you know that those environments are only possible through, through your generosity, in both your time, your talents, your abilities, but of course your resources as well. So can I just say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your, your continued generosity to this church. Um, thank you for making environments like that happen. Thank you for investing in the lives of real people with real stories, experiencing real life transformation towards Jesus. So thank you so much for that. If you've never given before, today's a great day, day to start as well. And so behind me on the screen, there's a number of ways that you can consider your giving here at Circle. And I'd love for you to explore some of those options. Again, you can also do that in person at the information desk if you're more comfortable with that. Hey, I'm going to pray in just a moment, and then um, I'm going to introduce our, our guest speaker for this, for this morning. But let's, let's pray uh, for our giving this morning. God, uh, thank you for this church. Thank you for uh, the ability that we have to host so many different environments, God, where people can come in and feel welcome, and they can belong, even if they don't believe what we believe, but that they can belong and they can experience community and authentic relationships, God, and they can journey through life with people and be loved and experience your love. God, I thank you that life transformation is happening in this place. And I thank you for this church, this generous church that gives their time, that gives their talents and their abilities and serve on teams. But God, also thank you for this church that is so generous with their finances, God. I just pray for both the gift and, a, and the giver, would you bless both? And would you use that to advance your kingdom here in Saskatoon? God, we commit this into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
Before I introduce our speaker, just one more thing. Uh, last week, Austin introduced an exciting new thing that we, we have going on at Circle. It's, it's on the YouVersion Bible app. And so if you don't have the Bible app on your phone, I'd really encourage you to take out your phone right now. You can go ahead and do that. Download the Bible app, and you can actually set Circle Drive Church as your home church on there. And you're going to be able to access message notes. You're going to be able to fill in the blanks. Um, I just find... Oh, it is so much more engaging when you're here on a Sunday morning to take notes while whoever is up here is speaking. You learn so much more, and you can take that back, um, you know, into your homes, into the rest of the, into the rest of your week. It's amazing. I'll look back on some of the notes I've taken like months ago and just see how God has used that over time to just do something in me. So I want to encourage you to do that. Thank you to the 150 of you that did that last Sunday. And that's, that's so awesome. We're so glad that we can have church community on a, on a digital platform like that. But go ahead and do that. If you need help setting Circle as your church home on the app, come and talk to one of us at the information desk. We'd love to, to help you with that. Um, it's just another great way that you can engage and participate in church community here on a Sunday morning. But I'm going to invite our, our next speaker up in just a moment. Uh, his name is Pastor Ron Gertson, and he's here from the Canadian Midwest District of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And he's going to continue in our series called To Be Continued as we journey through the book of Acts and the amazing things that the early church did. Uh, so he's going to come up and get set up. But while he's doing that, can I invite you to just stand if you are able and just welcome those around you. You know, tell them your name, get to know one another, and uh, Pastor Ron will be with you in just a moment. This morning, I would like to uh, greet you on behalf of all of the, uh, the Alliance churches across Canada, specifically the Canadian Midwest District, which is the district that, that we're in, which is Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Northwest Ontario, and up to Nunavut. And if you look at our, uh, our district on a map, you'll realize that we actually have the most beach line. Though it's northern beach, so it's not as uh, recreational as some of the other beaches in the world, but we've got a lot of beach in our district, so we're quite proud of, we're quite proud of that. I greet, you, I, I greet you also on behalf of our district superintendent, my boss, uh, Reverend Dr. Bernie Vanderwall, and the 72 sister churches in our district. Circle Drive has a very, very important place in my heart and in my history. I grew up in Saskatoon. I began attending this church in 1979. That's the previous century for those uh, young folks out there. And in 1980, I gave my life to Jesus at an evening service in spring of 1980. And I was sitting right around in there somewhere, and I remember that evening quite vividly. But we had evening services back then. We were more religious back then. I went off to Bible school, then four years later, I uh, came back as a youth intern and did a, an internship here at the church. And I was baptized in the sky, right there. Now, I'm not sure if I understand the baptisms in the sky are not, uh, they're not happening anymore. It's, uh, it is, we brought baptism down to, down to earth a little more. So that's a good thing. But if uh, any of you don't know what that is about, you'll have to get a tour of the building at some point. I think it's still there, right? And so. The passage that I've been invited to speak on as part of the To Be Continued series is an amazing picture of the Christian life in action. Sometimes the Christian life is viewed as something to know. The reality is it's also something to do. It involves information, but it also involves transformation. Christianity is an activity. 
not of theory. As such, we, I think, should be holding Christian practice. All of our lives, we took our kids to hockey practices, to dance lessons, to, uh, to music, music lessons. I think that there should be Christian practice, too. Same thing, you know, Wednesday night, come down and for, you know, Christian practice, we're going to work out a few things, figure a few things out. You could do stuff like, you know, well, it says here in the rule book we're supposed to forgive, so forgive. But coach, it's difficult to forgive. Forgive. But coach, give me five. No, give me ten. Ten commandments, and I want them in the right order. You know, things like that. I think there could be modules. There could be the why life's not fair module. That would cover a lot of life, that one. There could be telling the truth in love module. There could be the Christian in traffic module. <laughs> Taxation, temptation. All of these things. I think that the practical, practical nature of the book of Acts is why it's called the book of Acts. In James chapter 2, verse 17, we read that faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. I believe there's two ditches here. I'm going to ask my wife if she could bring up my water, my water bottle there. This is my wife, Leanne, which is my lovely assistant here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, honey. Hate to have me dehydrate right in front of you and just melt down here and stuff like that. You know? John would have to carry me off, though he has never done it on his day's work in his life, and so I'm not sure if, if, he, would even, if he would even try. Faith by itself not accompanied by action is dead. I believe that there are two ditches that we can fall in with regards to the Christian faith. We can fall into the ditch of treating it completely like it's a theory and information to know, or we can treat it completely like it's just uh, a moral list of to-dos. And the reality is it's kind of both and that's one of the beautiful dances of living the Christian life. We're about to see Philip put his faith into action. And so we read in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. This is the passage that was given to me, so it's quite a long chunk here, so here we go. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all of the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you were reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. Philip, a disciple of Jesus Christ, hears from God, obeys him, comes alongside an Ethiopian man who is seeking God, teaches him the basics of what it means to follow Jesus, and then the Ethiopian man places his trust in Jesus and in obedience is baptized. The Ethiopian was a high-ranking government official who was a eunuch. Quick note here, 
In order to rise in rank and be able to serve in close proximity to the royal family, government officials had to submit to castration to avert potential scandal and complications, just the way it was in that culture and in that day. He was obviously a very wealthy man, as is demonstrated by his ability to take the time off to travel to Jerusalem to, speak, to seek spiritual truth and travel from a foreign country. He did not, obviously, find what he was looking for in Jerusalem, but God had another plan for him. And God's plan was interaction with a person, and that person was Philip. He was reading the scroll of Isaiah, which would have been another indicator of his high position and wealth, as not just anyone had their own, own copies of Scripture in those days. The Gideons were not yet handing out New Testaments to grade five students at that point, apparently. His interest in Isaiah is fascinating. I'd like to take a little side trip. Two chapters beyond where he was reading was a passage of scripture that would have had a great personal impact on him. Isaiah 56, three chapters beyond where he was at. Starting in verse three. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says. To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name. Better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. The Ethiopian would have understand from, understood from reading this passage that God offers hope even to those living with irreversible reality, as was he regarding being a unit. Just as a aside here, and then to, to ask you a personal question, is there any irreversible reality in your life? Some loss that will not be and cannot be restored. Several years ago, our son Grant was killed in a car accident. That changed things forever for our family. A devastating loss that is now our ongoing and unchangeable reality. As I was preparing this message, and as I read that passage in Isaiah chapter 56, God just ministered to me again through his word in the recognition that there is promise, there are promises for and there is hope for those who have irre irreversible realities that they're trying to manage within their life. He has not left us. He walks with us in our pain and our heartbreak, and he has promised to do that. God wants to give you hope. He wants to give our family hope. He wants to tell you that he is with you, and he invites you to thrive with him, even though there may be something in your life that will remain, like a, a thorn in the flesh, as the Apostle Paul put it. You may think you will never be whole again because of something you have lost for some experience you cannot change, but he has another plan for you. Back to the Acts 8 passage. Two big lessons in this passage are summed up in one short sentence. Listen to God and obey. Listen to God and obey. You see, God does speak. In John chapter 10, Jesus, using a shepherd analogy to describe his relationship with his followers, says this, regarding the shepherd, which he was referring to himself. His sheep follow him because they know his voice. It's possible to grow in our ability to recognize the voice of God. And in Job chapter 33, we read, God does speak now one way 
now another, though we may not perceive it. Helping us to see that it could be sometimes when there's silence, that there's something God is trying to get through to us, and we need to persevere and be creative and have tenacity with regards to following, following him. Philip was tuned into God's voice and heard him clearly twice in the account recorded in Acts chapter 8. So how does God speak? He speaks through his word. The Bible is God's primary and clearest revelation to us. It's the standard by which we measure anything else we may think that we are receiving or understanding or hearing from God. His world, we learn in Romans chapter 1 that God has revealed himself to us in creation. In theological terms, this is called general revelation. It doesn't give us the specifics, but it helps us to understand that there is a creator, and therefore, he's our creator. Therefore, we must have some responsibility to him. He also speaks to us through his spirit. We have an example right here in Acts chapter 8 with Philip. But it could be that you have experiences in your life too where there have been subtle promptings in your life and you just know that God's making you aware of something that you need to be understanding. His spirit is at work in your life. And his spirit is a, a present in the life of everyone who is a believer. God also speaks to his people, trusted friends, are often used by God as a source of guidance. So if God is speaking, what is he saying to us? If God asked you out for coffee this afternoon and you had an hour with him to sit down, what do you think he'd want to say to you? My mind immediately goes to, oh no, what did I do wrong? And I think that that's sort of a natural thing when we think of our accountability to God, that there's probably a few things that he wants to point out or draw attention to. So it's easy to assume that it would be words of correction, which is certainly one way the Holy Spirit operates in our life. In Psalm 139, we read, Search me and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That should be a request that we as followers of God would have that we would ask and point out things that need to be pointed out, Lord. Okay, so there would be words of correction or maybe direction. We are told in Proverbs chapter 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. But is God solely in the business of correcting and directing? He is, after all, our Heavenly Father. I know what it means to be a father. Leanne and I have, have children, we have grandchildren. And a father, from my perspective, wants to talk to his children, I know I, know I do. As much as I'm interested in providing direction and correction, and I am very interested in providing direction and correction to my children, even though they're in their mid-30s now, my primary interest is to communicate words of affection. I love them and I want them to know that. I try to say it as often as, as often as I can. So if I, an imperfect father with limited communication skills, have this deep desire to communicate with my kids, how much more must God desire to do the same and how much better equipped must he be to be able to do that? In John 3, 1 John 3, 1, a beautiful place to turn in scripture to be reminded of this important truth. This is a verse you can just soak in. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The word lavished is, lavish is so thick and rich. God is absolutely crazy about you. He loves you, but he not only loves you, he likes you and wants to be with you and hang around with you. He is for you. 
And if you heard nothing else today, or maybe you just woke up and heard that, you can go back to sleep again. Because that may be the most important thing for you or for any of us today. And he wants to walk with us. Whatever life circumstances we are currently experiencing, whether in challenges we're facing or joys we're celebrating. But once God has spoken to us, we have a decision to make. And that is, what are we going to do about it? Obey is the correct answer here. In, in this passage, we see both Philip and the Ethiopian exercising exemplary obedience. Philip goes where he's told by the angel of the Lord to go and does what he is told by the Holy Spirit to do. The Ethiopian man follows the, scripture directed, the scriptural directive to be baptized immediately. What are we to obey? Jesus boiled things down very clearly for us by giving us the great commission and the great commandment. The great commission found in Matthew chapter 28 verses 20, sorry, 28 verses 19 to 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Go, make disciples, baptize them, teach them. All of this is happening in this passage. This passage is just a beautiful summary of the Christian life. Making disciples is an intentional process. It doesn't just happen with the passing of time. It could be that you've followed Jesus for 20 years. And it could be that you are 20 years down the road because you've got 20 years of experience. But it's also possible to have one year of experience 20 times and to never have grown up. Ask yourself, am I growing? Am I growing? One of the ways we can look at is, who was I one year ago and who am I today? And it could be that you may be hard-pressed to answer that question, but the person who's sitting beside you might have a really good opinion on that and help you understand how your growth has been going over the last year. But you know, how your growth has gone over the last year does not even matter because that's history. But if you were to decide on April 30th, it's April 30th, right? April 30th, 2024, I'm going to ask myself that question again. And there are things that I hope I can answer dif differently. And then set yourself to a life of, of discipleship, a life of, of growing. It could be that there are things you need to deal with. It could be that there are things you need to address. But the April 30th, 2024, you could be vastly transformed from today's version should you so choose and lean into what God has for you. So that was the Great Commission. How about the Great Commandment found in Matthew chapter 22? Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus was asked. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love God, love people. So the job description of the believer is really quite straightforward. Love God, love people, make disciples. There's certainly a lot to it, but it's kind of easy to communicate quickly, isn't it? Jesus is quoted in John 13, as saying, a new commandment I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this will everyone know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Just a side note here, the world is watching us. And I know throughout my life, whenever, whenever anyone knew that I was a Christian or whenever anyone knew that I was a pastor, there was just sort of this... Well, first of all, their language cleaned up right away, and so that, uh, that uh, was what it was. 
but also their eyes were on me and their expectations were no doubt raised for how I handled situation and how I behaved. So what does this love look like? There are a series of one another statements in the New Testament that we have to pay attention to. Now I, I gave this to, to Brandon and he made a, some slides of it and I think they're just gonna sort of roll but there are 58 times in the New Testament where there are one another statements. 15 times we are told literally to love one another. 15 times. And these are, these are commands. Sometimes when you know, we say, hey, God said holy, 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 he must really, really, really mean it. What about this love one another thing? 15 times. But there's also live in harmony with one another. Greet one another with a holy kiss. What I'd like to do right now, if everyone would stand up, maybe not, but on the way out, you know, if you want, <laughs> if you want to stop by, is that the information booth or the kissing booth? <laughs> maybe there's two booths out there. Check that out. Serve one another. Carry each other's burdens. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Spur one another on towards love and good deeds. I, I carry this piece of paper around with me sometimes, and I refer to it often, and I actually made a, a number of copies, and I left them back in the, uh, in the sound booth, if anyone's interested in taking that, but I also could email them if anyone is interested uh, in contacting Darcy or myself, there would be an opportunity just to have those, and this is a good thing for the fridge. There we go. I don't know if you operate with to-do lists, but this is God's to-do list for you in your relationship with the people in your lives. This list, list serves two functions. It gives us something to aim for and measure ourselves against, but it also helps us to come to the place where we recognize we cannot live this Christian life on our own power. There's not a chance. The expectations for us as followers of Jesus Christ are impossible on our own power. In Ephesians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul in a prayer to the Ephesians says, um, he is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. That means if you're thinking about how good the Christian life could be or how good a relationship, with, well, a relationship could be, if you're, if you're able to think about it, that means you've undershot because he is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us. So if we want to experience the full measure of what God has called us into relationship for us to experience, it's got to be done on his power. We have to ask his spirit. I mentioned earlier the spirit is present, present in our life if we are believers. But there must come a choice and a time in our life when we make him president, not just present, and yield ourselves to him and receive all that he has for us in order that we could live this beautiful life that he has given to us. What flows out of your life? Every time you interact with somebody, you have the opportunity to speak words of life, of healing, and of hope. And this is part of the life of being a believer. Anyone who encounters a believer should have been lifted because that person spoke life and light and hope into their lives. Whether it's someone that you come in contact with incidentally this afternoon for 10 seconds, which sometimes is easier than the person you actually live your whole life with, but absolutely the people who are closest to you and who you are doing life with. Speaking words of life, speaking words of hope, speaking words of truth. When we choose to invest in the lives of others, one thing becomes very obvious. Some relationships, more than others, are challenging. So we need to relentlessly pursue right relationship. But they were 55% at fault. It doesn't matter if they were 95% at fault. Take responsibility for your 5%. You can't make anyone else want to seek your forgiveness, but you can forgive. The Apostle Paul wrote a beautiful, concise statement regarding our relationship with others. Make allowance, 
make allowances for each other's faults, and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. This is Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, in the New Living Translation. And it was when I read it in the New Living Translation that all of a sudden it lit up for me because it uses the word make allowances for each other's faults. The other words in other, uh, in other translations mean that, but seeing the word make allowances just lit it up for me. This is a verse that is transformational. This is one that you should write down, put on your fridge, we have another booth after the service. It's a tattoo booth, and you could get your, this tattooed on you somewhere. Is that okay? We did have that third booth, the kissing booth and the tattoo booth. Okay. A lot of booths in there, out there, you know, so this is a good thing. But a quick word about being offended, because it says here, forgive anyone who offends you. A quick word about being offended. Choose not to be. Choose not to be. An unoffendable person is a person who is living in peace and freedom. There are two types of people in the world. Probably way more, but in this category, there's two types. My dad used to tell me, when people say things to you, they'll say all kinds of things to you, but sometimes you just have to let it go off like water off a duck's back. Water off a duck's back. Just let it go. Don't dwell on it, just let it go. The two types of people in this category are the water off a duck's back people and the Velcro people. It's possible that every word that you ever hear that is ever spoken within earshot of you just clings to you and sticks to you and you cannot let it go. We have to learn how to forgive. We have to learn how to, to not let it catch us in the first place and let, let it roll off our back like water off a duck's back. Make allowances for each other's faults. Forgiveness, we learn from this passage and elsewhere in Scripture, is a command. Does anyone in your life have power over you because of something they have done to you? They have done something, and now they have power over you. It's time to forgive and to release them. I have a, a friend who's a, a First Nations pastor. Someone called him up one day and asked if my friend would perform his wedding. Perform this guy's wedding. Complicating factor. The man asking had, many years ago, murdered my friend's father-in-law gone to prison for his crime, and now was out. Now, many years later, this request. My friend had talked to his wife, obviously, it was her dad, about this, and their reaction was that they should do this wedding and that it would be an important step on their journey of forgiveness and healing. That is next level forgiveness. You may never have to forgive anyone at that level, but you will have to forgive people, and this is a choice that we must continually make to forgive. When forgiveness for another person seems impossible, that's where God's power kicks in, if we ask, because it's his power at work in us that's going to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. There are some things you think, this will never work, this will never happen, I will never be able to do this or that other thing. But that's a place where God can prove that he can do immeasurably beyond anything that you could ask or even imagine. As we close, five questions to ponder that come out of today's passage. Question one, what is your practice of engaging scripture? The Ethiopian was... He had it on in the car, in his chariot, as he was reading the prophet Isaiah. What do you do? How do you make sure that you're interacting with God's word on a regular basis? Because God wants to speak to you through his word, 
And so if we're not reading it, then there are things that we're going to be missing. Question one. Question two. When is the last time you read something in the Bible and it prompted immediate action? The Ethiopian read this, heard it explained, got baptized. When is the last time that God made something just so completely clear to you through Scripture that you said, things are changing today? Third, third. What is the next step God is calling to you in relationship with him? It could be, like me in 1980, in the springtime of 1980, sitting right around there, that was the day I knew this is the time I have to give my life to Christ. It could be that you've been investigating, thinking about this for a long time, and it could be that today's the day you just pull the pin on that and say, Jesus, I'm yours. Interesting thought. Whenever you do that, it's going to be today, at that day. So it might as well be today, because it's today. I have to think about that too, so just that. Or it could be you've never been baptized. And you look at the example of the Ethiopian here and recognize this is something that I need to obey the Lord in. And I understand there are baptism services coming up in the next few months. And I would challenge you in that regard. Number four, how does God want to use you in somebody's life today? Maybe you can't get somebody out of your mind and you don't know why that is, but now maybe you're thinking maybe you do know why that is. And there's a phone call you need to make, there's a coffee you need to have, just uh, see how someone is. Because God directs like that. God directed Philip like that to the Ethiopian. And lastly, is there a relationship that you need to make right? Is there a relationship you need to make right? Take the first step. How easy it is for us to think, well, if they come this far, this far, maybe I'll consider it. They're not coming. Christianity is an initiatory faith. Jesus, God took the initiative. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He wasn't waiting. Well, once they clean themselves up a bit, they'll see if maybe it's worth me going to the cross. Not how it happened. Initiate. Take the first step. Let's bow in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the book of Acts in which we just see you at work, and we recognize how you do work and how beautiful it is. Lord, you have things that you want to do in each of our lives this morning. And so I just place us in your hands and ask God that you would give us the, uh, the willingness to live in a posture of obedience so that when you point something out to us that we are willing to say yes, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Ron. Appreciate that very much. I, I love that line that the Christian life is an activity, not, not a theory. I very much appreciate that and the, and the challenge in, in your message today. And, uh, you know, if you, if you felt um, anything from that, from that message and, or you're just here this morning and you need to talk to someone, whether you need prayer, uh, you just need to speak with someone, we would love to have a conversation with you. Our prayer team is located just outside of the auditorium and to your right. They're in the chapel. They would love to speak with you. They would love, love to pray with you as well. Um, if, if you're new to church, if this is maybe one of your first few times here, maybe you've been here for a while, and you don't have a Bible, uh, we would love to give you a Bible. So if you're here and, and you would love a copy of the Bible, come and see one of our team at the information desk. We'd be happy to give you a, a Bible there. Uh, just to note, our, our kids' ministry goes right till 11.45, so if you have a little one to pick up from there, um, we might be done a few minutes early here, but just give them a little bit more time there. They'll be ready to be picked up right at 11.45. But yeah, what a great service. I'm so glad that you could join, join with us um, here uh, for our Sunday service. Uh, but we're going to end with one more song. So uh, team, come and take us, take us away. Let's stand up, everyone. 
last song and just sing it up. a wonderful week. God loved us so much that the weather this week is going to be amazing. So go out, show God's love to someone else, and have a wonderful Sunday. See you next week.